I'm Steve Clements. I direct the American Strategy Program here at the New America Foundation, and we have been uh, just through a very large conference today focused on the London G20 Summit and how to think about how to kickstart global growth. I'm here with Martin Wolf, Associate Editor of the Financial Times and Chief Economics Commentator for the FT, also the author, author of the Johns Hopkins University Press published book, Fixing Global Finance, which you have here. And I, I wanted to just take a few minutes to ask Martin, good to be with you, can global finance still be fixed? Because you wrote this book before the current crisis. Yes, well, one has to be even more ambitious than I thought. Uh, 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 but of course, things can always be fixed. One has to believe that. This book is predominantly about the long history of failure of the global financial system to create a stable monetary order and therefore stable flows of capital to emerging economies. This led to a whole series of crises, which I think in the final uh, result led to the background for the huge global imbalances of the, this decade, the immense borrowing by the US, which was particularly the household borrowing, which is, in my view, the trigger for the crisis. So that's the background. And what I think we have to do is to move into a world in which emerging countries are more comfortable about borrowing more, because that's where the capital ought to go. The capital ought to go to the young countries, young economically, with the huge investment opportunities. It uh, used to be that way. Yeah, it used to be the way back in the late 19th and early 20th century, actually when the US was an emerging economy, it was a huge capital importer for precisely this reason. That means a lot of reforms in these countries, but I think in the present circumstance, that also means giving them support in the form of a bigger reserve insurance system. The IMF is a reserve insurance system. Instead of that each country insuring itself and accumulating trillions of dollars of reserves in, in, in foreign currency reserves, that's one reason we've got these huge current account surpluses in the world which the US has been offsetting. And I think increasingly now there is a case for going back to the so-called special drawing right, which is uh, an instrument of the IMF which allows essentially the IMF to create foreign currency reserves. Essentially, you're transferring purchasing power to emerging countries, actually to all countries. The emerging countries would use most of it. They will then import more. That will support demand. We are desperately demand efficient in the world, and it will allow the U.S. to export its way to some extent. That out makes of the so much. That makes so much sense because if you wanted to find a way to stimulate demand in the United States, uh, and, and as I look at it, when you look at countries, the surplus countries like China, Germany, and Japan. Uh, uh, and, and, and Japan is on its back in a lot of areas. China is doing a lot. I think it needs to do more. Germany, in my view, is more sluggish uh, than it should be uh, in, in the region. But if you're going to create another stimulative side to both restore order in the developing world and stimulate, SDRs make a lot of sense. What's keeping this from being sort of well, a automatic, well, why aren't we rushing this in This is direction? a novel, I, it's not a novel idea in the sense it was around 40 years ago, but then for a very long time the problem disappeared. First we thought when we went to floating exchange rates we didn't really need foreign currency reserves. Then there was a long period when we were very confident that private markets would solve the problem, that we would, we, the countries didn't need to insure themselves, capital would flow just freely from up, through the private sector, and then we discovered all these terrible crises, one after the other. And then in the final episode, we allowed the U.S. to create the reserve simply by running these huge deficits, and that uh, was financed by essentially the printing press in the U.S. and the rest of the world by it. So we've gone through a whole series of alternatives in the last four decades to that original idea. Now we come back as an almost like full circle to realizing that, just as they did in the 60s, that having a whole monetary system rest on one country's currency, which is everybody else in the world wants to hold, that current country therefore tends to run a very large current account deficit. It doesn't have right. to be, but it's plausible. That its money expands massively. Well, that's been what's been going on. And of course, internally, that has meant this huge borrowing in the household sector. Now we can see well, one result of that is the American government has to do the borrowing. It is still credit worthy. People do want to hold these liabilities. But actually, this is an incredibly unreasonable, unbalanced economy. The idea that we should open up the world economic system and open up global capital flows so that capital should flow from poor, risk-averse countries to a, the richest country in the world, which is sort of, has been risk-loving, is crazy. So that is why I think we have to go back to a system which generates reserves automatically without the having to earn it so much through real goods and services, which allows them to right. buy, goods and buy goods and services, and demand can go back into these countries. 
essentially you're providing them with purchasing power, which we want them to have in the current world. Now, once we have are back to very full dynamic economies in a few years, and I think it will take a few years, maybe we should then stop these issuance. But right now, the case, I think, for issuing SDRs in perhaps a uh, quarter of a trillion dollars a year or so for a few years could make a big difference to the to the demand and even more to the feeling in emerging economies that we are concerned about them. After all, nearly all of them are innocent victims of this crisis, but they will be among the worst hit. Just finally, you've written recently that thus far you haven't been uh, bowled over by the plan uh, from the Obama team and that we still have a chronically underfunded, uh, uh, undercapitalized banking system. We're going into London on April 2nd uh, with who knows what plan. What do you think Barack Obama needs to beat not only Mark, Martin Wolf's expectations, but, but global expectations? The, the big problem the U.S. is in, in my view, and I've said this now in many columns, is that, it, as it were, the administration is suffering from too many constraints. So many constraints that there isn't a solution. You know, there's a, the, the solution is a null set. Uh, there is nothing there. Uh, the problem is they have decided after Lehman that they can never let the creditors lose again. I think that's a mistake, but that's the decision they made. They know the banks are undercapitalized, and they know they have a lot of bad assets. But if you don't allow the credits to lose, creditors to lose, either you have to get lots of private capital into these institutions, and nobody wants to risk it because they are frightened of the long-term losses here, or you have to put lots of public capital into these institutions, and Congress won't give it to them. They know they won't get the scale of money they need. So they have had to find a way around the problem. They don't want the creditors to lose, They don't want the, and they can't get the money from the public sector. And I think the whole system they developed is a way around these impossible constraints. So first get the prices up a bit in the market with these devious ways of using Federal Reserve money. Then use the stress testing, which they're clearly going to introduce, to reveal in some way the whole. I don't know whether the, how honest they're going to be about this. I think they have to be very honest and brutal about it. And then they have to f find some way of doing a private capital placement, uh, a public offering, which the government guarantees in some way, underwrites. And what I expect to happen, it's not what I think is at all optimal, I think it's rather horrible, is that the government will underwrite such a huge set of, of capital uh, raising exercises for the big banks, and quite likely we will see the Federal Reserve buying a lot of it. Mm. So the Federal Reserve has become, if, I li if you like, the slush fund du jour for the government, and it's very ingenious, it's clearly the way they're going, and it's not the worst of all possible outcomes, except it's an end run around the whole fiscal system. And the core issue here is that the body politic has proved very resistant to a rational solutions, which is very like what happened to Japan. Mm -hmm. And I, so I sympathize with them. Right now, today, nobody has real confidence in the financial system. Let me add one fundamental thing. We understand the problem with the financial system. The whole so-called shadow financial system in the U.S. has disappeared. That means the total lending capacity in the U.S. Mm -hmm. has actually shrunk dramatically. So the banking system not only needs enough capital to offset its losses, it needs a large addition in capital, both because the private markets want them to be much more capitalized than ever before, because they realize how risky they are, and to expand their lending to offset the disappearance of the rest of of the lending system. So the really big point is the US banking system needs a hell of a lot more capital than it now has. My guess is way above a trillion dollars more if you allow for mm. all these problems, the fact that everybody wants more capital to be seen in the banks against risk and the fact that it has to expand. And if this doesn't happen, there will no, be no revival of lending. And if there is no revival in lending, the economy won't really recover. Well, thanks for that truth-telling. As you and Laura Tyson both said, it's, it does seem that there are a number of people who think there is the capacity in this country to make those commitments, but maybe uh, there's some doubt about the will. And thanks so much for this. I look forward to your coverage of SDRs and of uh, the London Summit next week, and we look forward to all of that. Thanks very much, Martin. Thanks, thanks Steve.